Welcome to Liberating Faith Podcast. I'm so glad that you have tuned in to listen. I'm Dr. Michael Stenhammer, and I have studied the Word of Faith movement for a number of years. I was part of it. I've done a lot of research, and I want to share some thoughts and insights here that might be of help to you. So listen in and see what you think. So getting the story right, that's our focus in this podcast. And what I mean by that is let's get the power of story. And let's understand how story works within our theology, within the word of faith, the prosperity gospel, but also within our, you know, biblical theology. Before we get into the details of this podcast, let me just give you a brief outline so you know what I'm doing and where I'm heading. I want to give you a quick overview of the power of story, because people think that the world is shaped by ideas and and data and facts and principles, while in fact, it's stories that shape the world. So I want to introduce that concept to you, and then I want to use that to understand more of what's going on in the faith and prosperity gospel, but also more into the biblical story. So what I share in this podcast is extremely helpful. These would be perspectives that have revolutionized my life. They have revolutionized my thinking. And I, I, I can tell you that Congratulations. Uh, Santa Claus came early this year because I believe what I will be able to share with you will be gifts. You might not be very familiar with the faith and prosperity gospel with these charismatic movements. And even if you're not, the, what I'll share will, will be empower you to, to grow in your walk with the Lord and in your understanding of the Word of God. If you have been more deep into the Word of Faith, the prosperity gospel, these charismatic movements, you might find that this will even expand your understanding and your horizon. All right. So I just want to begin with a scripture from 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Paul writes this, brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children in regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. And and for those of us who are a bit more familiar with the 1 Corinthians, you know, the book, we know that this chapter 14 is right there together with the spiritual gifts. Uh, You got chapter 12. Uh, uh, on the spiritual gifts, you got chapter 13, of course, love being the highest and the most important uh, work of the Spirit and gift of the Spirit. But then, of course, 14 comes back to, to gifts of the Spirit. And in that context, Paul says, stop thinking like children. All right. And of course, this has nothing to do with children having a lower value or anything like that. This is more just a, uh, his point of maturity, that God has called us to mature. And this is so uh, important for us, especially if we grown up in contexts where we were used to somehow just submit and follow a strong leader, then this has not been really uh, given to us. This space of taking responsibility for our faith, this space of growing. Yet there was always that 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 you know expectation that you always submit to the insight of those above you. Right. But Paul is not in that opinion. He is more uh, empowering every believer, every brother and sister to mature in their ways of living, in the ways of thinking. So I want to encourage you here that that take this and encar- this words uh, seriously as a as an um, impetus, as a, a an empowerment to grow, to to mature in your theological thinking and to take responsibility for it, that we don't just lean on what some other ones are saying and teaching, but that we start to take responsibility for our faith. So what I'll share here is something that I believe will bring you into a newer level of maturity. At least it did me. I feel that what I, what I will teach here has, has really empowered me. So let's get straight to it. And I'll begin with two quotes from two people uh, uh, from the secular arena. All right. And I'm not by quoting these people, I don't support what their agenda or their, you know, their worldview in any way. I just find that these two quotes are very helpful as a kickstart. All right. So one comes from this uh, American entrepreneur called Mark Cuban. uh, And he says the future belongs to those who can create the best stories. Wow. And then Steve Jobs, he might not need an introduction, but he was the founder of, of Apple. He says that the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation that is to come. So what what comes out of from both of these quotes is that the idea of the power of story, not just the power of story in in a general sense, but the power of story to shape the future. All right. That stories are the most powerful thing and they are the ones Uh, You know, stories are the ones to shape the vision, our values, what we think is important, what we don't think is important, what we prioritize, and so on. And this is not just true in in an economic sense or in, in the world of entrepreneurship and business. We can bring this straight into 
theology. Theology is about storytelling. It's about sharing what is God's big story of the world. And I don't know where you come from, but when I started to encounter these ideas uh, of story, th this perspective, this dimension of story, that the, the theology or the understanding the Word of God demands of us to understand it as a story, that was totally new to me. What storytelling? I thought when you heard story, I thought about once upon a time. I thought about bedtime stories, right? And I was kind of trained that the moment you hear the story, there's a red flag up there uh, saying that this is not, you know, story is not true. Stories are not true. What's important are ideas and principles. So w when I went to Bible school and in, in those areas where I was kind of starting off my Christian life and ministry, the idea uh, w was, uh, I mean, the, you looked for the big idea and ideas were there and principles were there. Those were the ones you were looking for. When you study the Bible, you looked for a, a principle or you looked for, you know, an idea and so on. And I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea that what, what's bigger than the ideas and the principles is, an, is that all those things fit into a bigger story, a bigger story of how we think the world operates, how we think the world is. Even the way I read the Bible, I read the Bible through a lens, a lens created in a big, big way by the story I think is true for the world. Okay, so there's a, a social psychologist, his name is Roy Baumeister, and he has said that uh, for any worldview to really have uh, power in our lives, it has to answer four questions, all right? So for any story, for any worldview to really have power in our lives, it needs to speak to our sense of identity. Who am I? So the story we hold to as the true story of the world somehow speak to our identity. It, it shapes the way I think about who I am. But I also think it shapes the way uh, I value uh, the, my, my, my scale of values, right? Do I matter? And really also what matters, okay? But also this story or this perspective of the world is what, what purpose do I have? What, what am I here for? Why am I here? All right. And then finally, he says, the story we have to um, look into that we, we somehow uh, have given ourselves to and embraced as the true story of the world also somehow speak to our agency or our empowerment. Can I make a difference? So the, what's I, what I find to be so interesting with these questions is that when you look at the word of faith, the prosperity gospel, they have been able to speak to these questions in a very powerful way. The way they shaped their theological story speaks very powerfully to our identity because it says you are right now sitting with Christ and you are ruling and reigning, right? You are a king. You are a queen. You are not just nobody. You are the righteousness of God in Christ, right? And do I matter? Of course you matter. You have ultimate value in a sense, at least as a child of God. And your purpose is to, to live out and to to further the kingdom of God here by, by victory, by faith. You tap into that. And can you make a difference? Yes. And what can what, the thing that stand between you and making an impact in this world is your faith or lack of faith, right? So when you look at how a story can, can speak to these very important dimensions of our humanity, identity, value, purpose, and agency, you find that this, I think, taps into the amazing power of the prosperity gospel, the Word of Faith movement, because they have been able to tell a story. They have been master storytellers, theological storytellers. That, that shaped the biblical understanding in a different way, so it spoke to these different questions. But we have to be careful because even the Bible warns us against false gospels, right? False stories. And you find this very clearly in, in the life of Jesus in the gospels, that people interpreted Jesus in different ways. They placed him in different stories. Of course, there's only one true story that does justice to Jesus' identity. Right. And that is the gospel story, the story of the kingdom of God. That's the story of Jesus that defines his identity. But there were other stories out there. There were stories of the Pharisees. Right. There were stories of the 
the Sadducees, who who uh, who were uh, you know more politically oriented and economically oriented, and they want to keep the status quo, and they had this certain story of the world that 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 they live by, and through that they interpreted Jesus in a certain way. The Pharisees, of course, they had their own interpretation. They thought that the kingdom of God will come by uh, you know law keeping and and living according to to the law. So they interpreted Jesus from that angle. So whatever story they, they had, they, they interpreted Jesus through that lens. And of course, they, we can call it the zealot story or the story of violence, where, where people expected a, a Messiah who would come with violence to establish the kingdom of God, to defeat the enemies, and especially the Romans, and ex- establish the kingdom of God. So you find that all these different stories were there, and they tried uh, these stories of the Messiah, and they tried to define Jesus according to those stories. But you'll find that Jesus goes against each one of those stories, and, and then he, he places himself in his own kingdom story, the one that is the true story, right? So why do I bring out Jesus and these uh, different kingdom stories at the time? Well, because it shows us that there is still a a battle, even at that time, and it still is a battle. What story defines Jesus and what story defines you? Okay, because all of us, we, we live out of a story that we believe is true for ourselves. And when it comes to theology, all of us have a story that defines Jesus. Who is Jesus? What, why does he matter? What is his purpose? Does he make a difference? All those things about Jesus, right? His identity, his value, his purpose, his agency, all those things, uh, we, tr- we answer them through the help of a bigger story that we have. And you might think, I don't, man, man, I don't know. I don't know if I have a story. You do. All of us do. We created that way. We created to live out a story. The question is, are you aware of the story you're in? Are you aware of the theological story that through which you, uh, you know, interpret Jesus, through which you interpret the Bible? I lived in the Word of Faith story for a long time. I had not, I didn't have an idea that there even was a story. But again, coming back to the, the, uh, you know, the scripture I started with for First Corinthians fourteen twenty, there that this is about maturity. Maturity is about going from the idea that, you know, from the understanding that there's just loose hanging ideas, there are just truths hanging there, there's some verses here or there, to start to see that you actually live out of a bigger story. Later on, I'll give you some practical ways of trying to identify the story you're living in. But for the moment, I just keep on here for a while and, and just, you know, just want to expand on some other things here. So the, the thing is that that's so important to realize, though, is that we are created as human beings for story, to, to understand the world through story and to live out of the story. So, for example, and, and I kind of, many, you know, uh, adapt this example from N.T. Wright, who's his big into story and narrative knowing and things like that. But he speaks about, for example, let's say you hear sirens. Maybe you're out walking in the park and you hear some sirens going off, you know. You know, those kind of things. And, and you hear those sirens, and the moment you hear them, those would just be a blip, right? They, there's just a, a, a pixel, just a, 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 frag, a fragment of information and data that reaches us. But the moment it does, you create an inner story. Oh, maybe, yeah, that, that's, yeah, I just heard a loud, you know, loud bang a couple of minutes ago. That, that was probably a car crash. So the sirens I hear is probably the ambulance coming now for that car crash, right? Or, you know, you hear something else or whatever happens, you start to create these stories, whether they are true or not. We, we're created that way. We're created for story. If we just look at our lives, uh, what we do when we fellowship with one another, when we get to know people, we share stories. We share our life story, right? And, and the deeper you get to know somebody, it's dependent on how much of your life story they have gotten to know, right? And how much of their life story you know. So stories are are there for us to make sense of the world. Stories are there for us to get to know each other. We do it through the medium of storytelling. Of course, you also use stories for entertainment and all these things. So our lives are shaped by story and our theology is shaped by story, right? So what, what I want you to see, though, is that we are also in a battle of story. 
there's a story battle going on. And I, I, I see that most clearly from Genesis chapter 3. Because in Genesis 3, we have, we have Satan coming to Eve, and he comes with a fabricated story. Listen to what's going on. So now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sew, uh, sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. What's going on here? Genesis chapter 3, well, it's not just the devil giving them a lie. Well, of course, it's tr that's true. It's a lie, right? But what's happening is that the devil gives them an alternative story. He comes and says, he doesn't come and, and, and change reality, right? The tree is there with the fruit on it. He doesn't change the reality of that. What he does is that he gives an alternative interpretation. He gives them an alternative story. And the moment they embrace that story, the moment it, the story became the lens for the reality, that changed everything. It changed their actions. It changed their desires, right? So the devil comes here, the serpent, as a master storyteller. He subverts God's truth with an alternative story. A story in which God is no longer the hero. God is the villain. God is the, is the opponent that holds something back from Adam and Eve. Can you see how the story turns things upside down? It turns God from being the hero and, and, and uh, the good part of the story that he was and he is into being the villain that actually holds something back. So the, the, the craftiness of Satan is this alternative worldview story. And Eve, she enters this story. She allows that story to be the, the glasses through which she, she starts to look at the world. The tree has not changed. The fruit has not changed. What has changed is the story through which Eve perceives them. And when she looks through this story, now the, the, the tree becomes something more uh, enticing to her. And she, she sidelines, or she, she does sideline, but she agrees and she, and she, with the story of the devil and acts out of that. What this tells me is that, that if the original sin, the first sin of Adam and Eve was because of a story, surely everything else that will happen will somehow be story related. All other temptations will somehow be story related in our lives. And that also tells me that I, probably I believe that the, one of the greatest parts of spiritual warfare and battle is a, a, around story, which is God's true story of the world and which are lies, false stories that will make us act in a wrong way. Because all of us, we live out of the story and we see ourselves as actors within the story. All right. Uh, Alistair McIntyre, uh, he said this, he's, a, uh, he's a, um, a philosopher, and he says, I can only answer the question, what am I to do? If I can answer the prior question, or what story or stories do I find myself apart? So his point is that before I go into what am I to do, how am I to act, I need to understand the story that I am that I'm already part of. All right. And, and the underlying point that I want to make here is you need to identify the story that you have absorbed because you are living out of a theological story. You interpret the world and you interpret the word, God's word, out of this story. And an, an important part of growing up and mature is to start to identify it and then start to critique it from the word of God so that you can start to correct the story where it's not biblical to make sure that it actually fits uh, God's story for the world. And this is what I believe is about what Paul talks about renewing the mind. Because renewing the mind for Romans 12 too, 
is about renewing the story, the lens through which you are looking at the world. This is a big and important calling. Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There, there are scholars who say that the, the mind here is also, you can look at it as the transformation of not just your thinking, but your whole worldview. So do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, the way that this, the, and even the, the, the lies of the devil, these false stories that are out there, but be transformed. And how do you be transformed? By the, the renewing of your worldview and the renewing of your story, the story through which you live your life. Because if you only think that what, what makes the world go around are facts, ideas, and principles, you will be fumbling in the dark and you be a captive to a larger story that somebody else have somehow, you know, given you. And when I mean somebody else, I don't mean maybe necessarily one individual, but you have absorbed this story from somewhere else and you're even unaware that it even exists. It's like you having puzzle pieces, but you don't even see the, the, the big image where the puzzle pieces should fit together. All right. So coming into this dimension and thinking of story will empower you to start to see the bigger picture and to get into that idea of uh, or that dimension that ideas are not the most fundamental thing that drives the world. Stories are. And stories are what connects the ideas and empowers them. So that's what story does. I'll close with just a few comments on how you can identify your big story, your worldview story. So N.T. Wright or Tom Wright, he, he works a lot again, like I said, with stories. And he uh, identifies five different questions that can help you start to grasp the story in which you live, your, your big story or your theological story, all right? He says, if you, if you ask yourself five important questions and you answer them, honestly, you can start to reach where you are and, and what story you're in. And what's important here is, again, remember now that the world is not running by ideas and facts and data. It is more, more run by story and actions and practices and our innermost desires. So what we're after when you ask these questions is not how you intellectually will answer it, but look at your life. What, how do you live? And let your life become the answer to these stories, to, this, to these five questions. Because you live your life in this story. So the practices, how you live your life, what you prioritize, how you spend your time, your money, and all these things, uh, you know, what's, what you value, what you find to be most important, what, what, you know, what, what do you honor in life, and all these things. Uh, what makes you happy, what makes you sad, all these things, all these practices. Uh, on all these emotions and all these affections, they are part of answering these questions, okay? So I'm, I'm saying take a, a holistic look at your life, not just what's in your brain. It's also what's in your heart and what's in your hands, how you act. And let your whole life answer these five questions. When you do, you will come closer to your worldview story, to the story that drives you, to the story that also affects your interpretation of the Bible and everything. So these are the five questions he asks. He says, who am I? That's a question of identity, right? It says, where am I? That's a question of location, how, you know, or, or in even uh, cosmology, how does the world look like? So who am I? Who, who am I really, right? Where am I? But also, number three, what is wrong? That everybody shares an, an idea or an, or an impression that there's something wrong with the world. But what is wrong with the world? Then the number four, Tom Wright says, ask, what is the solution? And fifth, what time is it? So if you add, use these five questions, you will be able to start to penetrate into your worldview story and the, the theological story. So who am I? Where am I? What's wrong? What's the solution? What time is it? Start to look at your life. Use these as a mirror and start to look at your life in, in light of these five questions. Start to look at your, your theology through these five questions. You can start to ask this from a theological point of view and you will start to identify. I began by doing this and this is not a simple, uh, you know, uh, this is not simple. This is not for children. <laughs> this is for adults or at least those who want to mature, right? So this is not easy and it's good to do it together with a friend or your partner, you know, because this is this takes a lot of work.
and, and we will never be fully accomplished here. But I encourage you to do this. And I hope to maybe one day later on do a podcast on all these five questions and how we can use them more practically. So I just want to throw them out here. And, and again, Santa Claus came early this year <laughs> because these are, these are wonderful things. These are amazing, amazing tools for growth. So I want to end this podcast with giving you recommendations for reading. Uh, I usually do that, and that doesn't mean you have to read them at all. Uh, but I just found them to be helpful tools to keep on thinking because uh, all, all worldviews are shaped by abs uh, what you absorb and time. Okay, so what you expose yourself to and, and for how long you do it. So I would say... If you want to change your worldview, if you want to be more biblical, if you want to start to reflect on these things and enter into these dimensions of life, you have to spend time. You have to dedicate time to these things. So in the level of story, even if you found it to be maybe at this moment very difficult to grasp or hard to really you know, wrap your head around it, uh, I, I recommend a book called Hidden Worldviews. Hidden Worldviews, Eight Cultural Stories That Shape Our Lives. It's written by the philosopher Stephen Wilkins and Mark Sanford, and they are Christians. This is written from a very powerful, uh, you know, very, very good introduction text. Basically, you can learn how stories work, how our worldview is shaped by different kinds of stories. And what I love with this book is that they are giving examples of stories, of cultural stories in our world, of individualism, of consumerism, nationalism, and, uh, you know, the New Age story or the postmodern story or all these different things. And they help us to start to come into this dimension of thinking of story, that, which is so, so empowering. So it's, it's published by IVP. Uh, it was published 2009. So it's, it's a bit older, but you, you, I, I would recommend that as a good start if you want to think about story and how stories shape us, both theologically and in our cultures, especially at this time, right? We're living in times where we have clashes of stories. So... That, that's a really helpful one. So I hope that this podcast has been a blessing to you. Reach out to me at www.liberating.faith. I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to hear your input and your comments. If you have things you want me to, to somehow address in, in, in podcasts or in videos, let me know. Until I see you in videos and podcasts, God bless you.